Hi, everyone. Now, the way I'm doing this part of the lecture is I am going to try to be brief on the PowerPoint. What you need to do is where this PowerPoint resides, there's all sorts of other animations and videos that are going to go into more depth on each of the concepts I'm discussing here. So I will also be doing some of this in lab. So if you are confused, go through my animations, go through the videos that I've included on here. I'm not going to go through the video on this PowerPoint. You need to read and go through the lecture that accompanies this video and it will help you a lot. I've done some on my own and some came from YouTube but they are excellent and will walk you through some problems and some samples that you can do. Now I am going to talk about the next few slides pretty briefly. Sorry about that. And the first thing that we're going to talk about is a test cross. Now a test cross is on page 152 of your textbook and it is actually going backwards. Uh, it's a cross trying to figure out what the parent is. Is the parent homozygous dominant or heterozygous? Because the parent, one of the parents, shows the dominant trait but they don't know if they're homozygous or heterozygous. So what they do is they will cross them with a homozygous recessive. So in this case, you've got the black lab and the chocolate lab. The black lab could be either two possible genotypes if you're looking at the graphic, uppercase B, uppercase B, or uppercase B, lowercase B. If the parent is homozygous dominant, uppercase B, uppercase B, all of the offspring with a homozygous recessive chocolate lab, they'll only have black uh, labs. When you go to, if it's a heterozygous parent, then you're going to find that the, the offspring is going to be 50% chocolate, 50% black. Uh, so none of them will be homozygous dominant. So a test cross involves trying to determine if the dominant uh, trait in one of the parents, if the parent is homozygous or heterozygous. So it's actually trying to figure out what the parent is. It's an unknown genotype. Now a dihybrid cross is looking at two traits or characteristics. A monohybrid cross looks at one trait, like purple versus white. They were both the same traits, just different representations of it. One was recessive, one was dominant. Now the same thing here, we're going to look at two traits. And it starts off the same way. You start off with a parent that is maybe purple tall and they're homozygous for those traits. And then you're mating them with a parent that's homozygous recessive for two traits. That's the parental generation. Now they have the F1 heterozygous for both traits, but they look like the parent who had the dominant trait because that is what ex expressed. Now this video that goes with this, the two trait crosses, is inside the course. And you can look at it there. And it goes through what, uh, how to do a dihybrid cross. Now, incomplete dominance. That is another type of cross that you're going to see. And what basically is happening here is red is a, um, the only way you can express a red flower is by having two uppercase R genes. If it's a white 
snapdragon, then it's got two lowercase genes. What happens with the F1 generation is now you have pink. The red is no longer fully expressed. The uppercase R needs to have two of the same. It must be homozygous to express the red phenotype. The red allele is uh, a wild allele in the fact that the only way it fully expresses red is by having two copies of that gene. If there is only one copy of the R gene, that R cannot express itself the same way. It's sort of like a weakened R. So it, the only way you can express red in incomplete dominant is to have the two uppercase R's. Now there's also a video on this inside the course and a lot of other information if you don't understand. Recessive disorders. Now if a parent, and we're looking at humans here, most genetic disorders are recessive. There are several dominant disorders and I have a slide that shows it. But here we're looking at hearing. And the parents are heterozygous for the trait. In other words, they're carriers of the disorder, but they don't have it. And what happens is that each parent is going to produce one uppercase letter and one lowercase when it makes its gametes. They split apart and the gametes are, you, you can have a lowercase trait. But the only way it's going to be expressed is if the child got the lowercase letter from both parents. And in this case, if you do the Punnett square, you can see that there are three possible outcomes. Uppercase D, uppercase D, they don't, they're not carriers. Two are carriers, but are not hearing impaired. And then the one out of four that would be deaf because they have both of the recessive genes. Sickle cell disease is another genetic disorder. And we've looked at it a little bit in the past, but it has to do with one amino acid not being coded correctly for. So the hemoglobin is not made correctly and in turn it causes the red blood cells to become like a shape of a C. Inside the hemoglobin is deformed. So here is how it happens genetically. If an individual is homozygous for the sickle cell allele, they produce sickle cell hemoglobin. The abnormal hemoglobin crystallizes into long flexible chains and it causes the sickle cells to be uh, sticky. They get stuck in uh, the blood vessels. So they have to be homozygous for a sickle cell. It's the same as the slide we looked at before for the deaf. It's a recessive trait and it's only expressed when both parents have passed down the recessive trait. Otherwise, the parents can be carriers or not express the trait at all. Now a dominant disorder here is achondroplasia, which is one type of dwarfism. And here you can see you have a normal parent who has no achondroplasia, which is lowercase d, lowercase d, with a dwarf, which is uppercase d, lowercase d. You can only be a dwarf in the heterozygous um, there can only be heterozygous. If 
two dwarfs were to have a child and they passed on the achondroplasia and the child was homozygous dominant for the trait, they don't survive birth. They die before. That is why you don't see any dwarfs that are homozygous dominant. They're all heterozygous. And in turn, you can see that the if they mate with somebody who's normal, they have a 50% chance of having a child that is a dwarf. Now, ABO blood groups. This is quite complex. This chart is excellent. I am not going to explain it here because I have explained it and there are videos inside the rest of this um, course that will explain it. Plus, I do explain this in class and I go over detail how you can have red blood cells. But if you want to listen to the videos, well you should, uh, and you will see how the four blood types and how they're dominant and recessive and actually co-dominant, which is just another expression or type of expression of a phenotype. Now this slide goes over what happens with the red blood cells and if you have different blood types. If I were in class with you, I'd go through this and I will. And I'm not doing it on this PowerPoint because it I could go into this for 20 minutes and the PowerPoint would be excessively long. But there is a lot of information in your lecture and I will be going over this in lab. Now this is looking at the X and the Y chromosome. The, it's important to point out here that the Y chromosome in the male is much smaller than the X chromosome. And because of that, there are tr disorders that are sex-linked disorders that only males will have. And that's because they don't have a matching chromosome or allele on the Y chromosome. It doesn't have all of the same alleles that are on the X chromosome. So here, we're just looking at X and Y. Females are XX, males are XY. Now, they're, one of the sex-linked disorders is colorblindness. More males are colorblind, and it's because the gene is found on the X chromosome, and there's no match on the Y chromosome. And red-green colorblindness is very common in males. And if you can't see that there's a number in this, you may have this red-green colorblindness. This is showing the Punnett squares for colorblindness. And if you go through it, you can see how a normal female with a colorblind male, what are the chances of them having a child that's colorblind? Or a carrier female with a normal male? Or a carrier female with a colorblind male? Each of these are different and you can look at the chances of having a colorblind child, a carrier child, or an unaffected individual. Hemophilia is another sex-linked disorder, and it was really common in the royal families of Europe, and they did not realize it. What you are looking at there is a chart that you can make up. It's a pedigree chart, and it shows if they're carriers, they have the white and the orange in it. If they don't have the disorder in their genetic makeup, the square, which are males, are um, they don't have it. But if the, it's a square that's totally orange, that means that the male child has the disorder. And if you look at Alexandra and the Tsar Nicholas, he doesn't have it, she's a carrier, 
but her child has it. And that's because the Y chromosome has no match and can't stop it from expressing itself. So because it's on the X chromosome, the child has it. Now here you can look at, this is a generic type of chart when you're looking at sex-linked disorders. There are many others, and if you're looking in the book, you'll see that they discuss some. And you're looking at the female who may be normal, a carrier, or an affected female, which is very, very rare, but it does happen. And then you're looking at a male with one allele. Either they're normal or they're affected. And those are the possible uh, outcomes. And this chart is just talking about all sex-linked traits in general.